This is you. You walk into the bus stop after work, tired and minding your business. Suddenly, you're standing in the middle of the sidewalk, completely soaked. No warning, no umbrella, no jacket. And as you sprint for cover, frustrated, you're asking yourself, seriously? Why now? Why me? But maybe the right question is, why at all? Rain, snow, hell. We treat them like everyday things, just weather. But what if I told you that there's a whole story behind every single drop that falls? Today, let's talk about the untold epic of precipitation, where science meets nature. That snowstorm that shut down your town, that surprise summer downpour, that freak health stone that dented your car and once you understand it you'll never look at the sky the same way again before we dive into the drama of the clouds hit the like button if you've ever been curious about this topic and subscribe so you don't miss our next fascinating topic ready let's get into it okay let's run one time not just a few minutes not even hours let's go back days maybe even weeks because that rain dropped on your shoulder it's been on a crazy ride first here's the basic definition precipitation is any form of water liquid or solid that falls from the sky whether it's rain snow sleet or hail but this is just one piece of a much bigger system, the water cycle. Think of it like Earth's ultimate recycling machine. It moves water constantly between the surface and the atmosphere. This loop never stops and it follows three main steps, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Simple, right? But now, let's dig into how each step works. Step 1. Evaporation. This is where it all begins. Sunlight eats the Earth, but not evenly. Oceans, lakes, rivers, even puddles begin to warm. Water molecules get excited and break free. They evaporate in into the air. Think about boiling water on the stove. You know how the steam rises and the pot slowly empties? That's evaporation in action. Or when a paddle disappears on a hot day, it's just water turning into vapor and floating up. You can't see it, but trillions of invisible water particles are rising right now, becoming water vapor. Step 2. Condensation. As the warm vapor rises high enough, it meets cooler air. Cooler temperatures slow the vapor down. The molecules start to huddle, they condense, turning back into tiny droplets. Have you ever left a cold water bottle outside on a hot day and saw a little bit of moisture appear, that's condensation. The vapor in the air hits the cold surface of the bottle and turns back into liquid. Now, water needs support to condense on. Enter dust, pollen, and tiny particles floating in the air. This acts as condensation nuclei. That's how clouds are born. Without condensation nuclei, clouds couldn't form. So, next time you sneeze during allergy season, just remember, you might be helping the clouds build up. Give yourself some credit. As more and more droplets gather, clouds begin to grow. But just because you see a cloud doesn't mean it's ready to rain. Not yet. Step 3. Precipitation. Now, here's where the magic happens. Millions, no, billions of droplets are bumping and merging. Eventually, some droplets get big enough and too heavy to stay afloat. Then gravity says, time to fall. That's precipitation. But wait, there are no raindrops yet. Depending on the temperature of the air they fall through, they could become rain, snow, sleet, or hail. You know when people say, it's too cold to snow? That's not quite true. It just depends on what's happening up there in the clouds layers. Alright, let's talk about clouds. They might look soft and simple, but they are dynamic engines of weather. Once water vapor condenses on these particles, tiny droplets or ice crystals start to form. Over time, they gather more and more moisture until they become visible as clouds. But not all clouds are created equal. There are many types of clouds. Let's break down the types that really matter when we're talking about precipitation. First we have cumulus clouds. Out. You've probably seen this on a nice day. Big, puffy, white, classic fair weather clouds. They usually hang out during sunny afternoons. Most of the time, they don't do much. But under the right conditions, they can grow into something much bigger. Then we have cumulonimbus clouds. These are the monsters of the sky. Tall, dark, and towering like skyscrapers. If you see one of these, expect action. Thunderstorms, heavy rain, hail, maybe even tornadoes. They mean business. Then we have stratus clouds. Think of a grey blanket stretched across the sky, low, flat, and kind of gloomy. These clouds usually bring a steady drizzle or light snow. And last we have the Nimbostratus clouds. These are your classic, it's going to rain all day clouds. Thick, dark, and loaded with moisture. If one of these rolls in, don't bother hoping for sunshine. So, depending on what kind of clouds forms and what's happening inside it, you get different kinds of precipitation. And speaking of that, let's break down the various ways the sky decides to send water back to Earth. because it's 
not just rain. First we have rain. Now, this one is straightforward. Water droplet that stay liquid from clouds to ground. But the key factor, temperature. If the air between the cloud and the ground stays above freezing, which is 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then those droplets won't freeze. They fall as rain. So, that peaceful afternoon drizzle or the summer downpour that soaks your clothes, that's all thanks to warm hair all the way down. Then we have snow. Now, snow, that's something else. It forms way up in the clouds when water vapor skips the liquid stage entirely and turns straight into ice crystals. That's called deposition. These tiny crystals latch onto each other, forming snowflakes. But here's the catch. For snow to actually make it to the ground as snow, the air has to stay cold all the way down. If it warms up on the way, then we're dealing with something completely different, like sleet or even rain. Next we have hailstones. Now, hail is wild. It's not the same as snow or sleet. It forms in a very specific place, cumulonimbus clouds. These clouds have intense updraft, basically wind strong enough to carry water droplets upward into freezing layers of the atmosphere. Once those droplets hit the freezing zone, they become tiny ice pellets, but they don't fall right away. Updraft can keep tossing them back up, adding more layers of ice every time. Think of it like a frozen onion, layer after layer. Eventually, they get too heavy for updraft to hold, and just like that, they come crashing down as hailstones. Now, get this. The largest hailstone ever recorded in the US was nearly 8 inches in diameter, or about 20 centimeters. That's the size of a volleyball falling from the sky. Finally, we have sleet and freezing rain. Here's where things get a little tricky. Let's say precipitation starts as snow. If it passes through a warm layer of hair, it melts into rain. But depending on what happens next, you get either sleet or freezing rain. With sleet, the melted droplets pass through a second cold layer near the ground and freeze again. So you get tiny ice pellets. With freezing rain, the cold layer near the ground isn't thick enough to refreeze the drops. They stay liquid until they hit a cold surface, like a sidewalk, a tree branch, or a cloud windshield, and then they instantly freeze on contact. That's what causes those terrifying ice storms and makes roads super dangerous. So, now that we know the how, let's talk about the why. Why do some places get rain all year while others barely see a drop? It all comes down to climate, geography, and air circulation. Take tropical regions, for example, like the Amazon rainforest. These places are hot and humid. Warm hair rises constantly, carrying moisture with it. As the hair cools, moisture condenses and it rains a lot. In contrast, deserts like the Sahara are dominated by seeking hair, and seeking hair prevents cloud formation. No clouds equals no rain. Then we have mountains. They can force moist hair to rise. As the air climbs, it cools, condenses, and produces precipitation, rain or snow on the side facing the wind. But once the hair crosses over the mountain, it loses most of its moisture. So, the other side, dry as bone. This is known as the rain shadow effect. The type of precipitation we get is basically a vertical weather profile. It all depends on the temperature of the atmosphere from top to bottom. Meteorologists use weather balloons, radar, and even satellites to track these layers. For example, cold from cloud to ground, snow. Warm layer in the middle, sleet. Warm all the way down, rain. But how do we measure precipitation? On the ground, we use rain gauges, which are simple tools that catch and measure rainfall amounts. In the sky, radar systems send out radio waves that bounce off raindrops, snowflakes, and hailstones, helping us see what's going on even inside a storm. And then there's the high-tech stuff. Satellites like NASA's Global Precipitation Measurement GPM, orbit the planets, keeping an eye on global precipitation patterns. The help scientists track storms, monitor droughts, and understand how precipitation fits into bigger climate systems. Speaking of climate, let's talk about how climate change is shaking things up. As the planet warms, the atmosphere can hold more moisture. That means when it rains, it pours. Heavier downpours, stronger storms, and flooding are becoming more common. On the flip side, hotter temperatures also increase evaporation. That can mean longer droughts in some places, which dries up rivers, stresses crops, and even increases wildfire risk. In short, climate change is reshaping precipitation patterns around the world. And it's not just a weather story. It's a story about farming, clean water, and the future of life as we know it. By understanding the science of precipitation, we're better equipped to adapt to what's coming, and maybe even prevent the worst of it. Now back to you. You're still soaked and questioning your life. But what you may now realize is that one chop on your shoulder is on a never-ending journey. It might get absorbed by a tree and evaporated again. It might flow into a river, racing back to the sea. It might get filtered into groundwater, staying hidden for years before resurfacing. This isn't just about weather. Precipitation keeps life on earth going. It feeds crops, fills rivers, and sustains ecosystems. Too much, you get flowers. Too 
little, he gets drought. So next time it rains, don't just run for cover. Think of the journey, the heat of the sun, the invisible vapor, the clouds, the transformation, the never-ending cycle. That one drop on your shoulder, it's been traveling for ages just to land right there. Like you. Thanks for watching. If you found this journey as fascinating as we did, give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and share with someone who always forgets the umbrella. Let me know in the comments what topic we should explore next, whether it's science, history, mind blowing fact, or something else. Until next time, stay curious, stay kind, and remember, precipitation keeps life on earth going.